And today we're going to look at one of the most unusual self-defense canes, antique self-defense canes, that I've ever seen in person, and I've seen a lot of them. Pretty sure the last one I showed on my channel was the blowgun firearm cane. So yeah, I gotta admit, that one still wins, but this one here, yes, definitely unusual. But of course I need to show you more than just this picture to prove that, and I will after we set some historical context. Like with this, First Dynasty, Egypt, 3000 BCE, and we see our ruler is wielding a stone-headed mace. A very, a very long time ago in prehistory, people started hitting each other with sticks and said, oh, these work pretty well. And you know what? They work even better when there's a large end, right? When it's asymmetrical, there's a big knob maybe at the end on one side. And then they said, what if we replace the bigger end with stone? What if we make that the heavier side of the weapon. So you got things like this. Or this. The previous batch were from ancient China, and here is a supposedly antique Native American stone-headed club, Iwata Jinga. That's the best I can do. I have one I bought in Colorado years ago, a modern one that looks almost exactly like this. I gotta make a video on that sometime. Anyway, yeah, maces. The mace weapons family. And they started with round and or smooth stones, because that's how they naturally tend to occur. But then people said, we can enhance this. Obviously with materials, but what I want to focus on is shape, right? These knobs here, these points, make it more effective. And this shape here was used for a long time, but people could get more exotic with the surface area reducing shape, like this owl-looking one here. Or, of course, the flanged mace shape, like this one. This one has spikes and flanges. Uh, and, yeah, this is a snapshot of a video from my very own channel. I saw this one in person. About 2,000 years old, from Peru, as you saw. And speaking of ancient South American weapons, this one also from my channel that I got to see in person. And it doesn't have flanges, but it has this kind of star shape with these knobs, right? They're not flattened, but they do reduce the impact to pretty much one, maybe two of those knobs at a time when contact is made. Quick reminder, this one here is made out of iron and silver, which is really interesting. But anyway, uh, this evolution that we've been talking about is not as straightforward as it might seem. Not at all, especially if we're talking about world history. So you can go way, way back to the Bronze Age and find something like this. And as you'll see, this round mace head has spikes. And they're not sharp spikes, but they're spikes. They're points. Whatever you want to call them. And the same protuberances on this shape here, which harkens way, way back. I've seen one of these in person. Not this one here, but I guess I forgot to take pictures uh, and video of it. Uh, these are usually way smaller than you expect, by the way. And yes, we're going to get back to this Victorian self-defense cane, uh, but not yet. And no, this knob here, this handle, it's not that this was used as a round mace head with the cane. It's just the handle for the real weapon. But speaking of the real weapon, this concept of adding spikes to the ball and or hitting portion of your weapon definitely kept going in some circles through to the Iron Age and beyond. And now once you've got iron and steel, well, then you can make these nice, long, sharp spikes. So you get things like this or the, uh, you know, the Chinese uh, wolf's fang spear, I think it's called, or things like this in Europe. And this was never as big of a thing as a layman might imagine, because it's probably, well, my guess is because it's kind of a pain to carry around a weapon like that. Especially if it's a single-hand weapon, a polearm, you know, you just carry anyway across your shoulder. But a single-hand weapon with really long, sharp spikes, like, what do you put it in? <laughs> you can't put it in a holder of any kind, and not really, like you can with a sword and whatever. And with a smooth or just stubby, you know, studded mace, well, you don't have to worry about, like, cutting yourself and cutting your horse or whatever. Speaking of the stubby, studded mace... Here's one, a real one, from the 20th century, just to show how enduring and useful this design is. It's a World War I trench club. But to touch on yet another weapons tradition pulled in by our cane, which we are going to look at, we have to talk about one of my favorite things, fighting flails. And as you guys probably know, anything with kind of a rod-like striking end descended from the agricultural flail, this instrument here. So you have a peasant tool turned into a peasant weapon, turned into a military weapon. 
and not the most common weapon on European battlefields or whatnot, but if you are going to use this kind of a thing for battle, not so much for a peasant revolt, but for a soldier who's actually going to be, you know, knows he's going to be in war, then you're going to look to enhance it. And you probably don't have the luxury of using like all metal or getting an all metal striking in. You might, but it's easier to just enhance the wood. So how do you do that? Todd from Todd's Workshop, along with Matt from Scala Gladiatoria, show us with a historical recreation of a military flail. Yeah, you add metal spikes. And we know this weapon here was a thing, was used in specific conflicts. As you've seen before on the channel, there's even fight manual visuals. Of course, I picked the funniest one this time. But anyway, we've now gotten to the point of not just a top-heavy striking implement, but a flexible top-heavy striking instrument, and one that uses a device from the older, rigid top-heavy striking instruments, the studs, the spikes. Movies and television shows would lead us to believe that the spiked metal ball seen in this ancient visual was the actual predominant version of the dynamic we just talked about, but of course it wasn't, and we're not even sure if these were ever really used. But popular culture really stresses this more theoretical ancient weapon. I do think they existed to some degree, but I digress. You know, this is really a HEMA video, basically, historical European martial arts. The antique we're going to look at is a European fighting antique, but I did mention one Chinese weapon, and we're talking about fighting flails. So we'll just mention that obviously there's Eastern analogs to this kind of thing. Nunchaku, which if you know my channel, you know I'm a fan of. There's a fighting flail, a short one. And the Kusari Fundo. Enrique Gusari, whatever you think the most appropriate name is. And boy, if you want to work out, play around with one of these. And yes, bringing it all back home, the antique, the Victorian gentleman's consumer product we're going to see kind of, sort of, in its own way, ties together everything we've been talking about so far in this video. Including something we haven't mentioned much but need to get back to, which is the self-defense cane. And especially of the hidden variety, like the last one I showed, here's that blowgun cane. Of course, it was actually a blowgun a firearm cane. That was the surprise there. What's the surprise today? Well, you're about to see. But yeah, defense canes hidden defense canes. This one here, there's nothing hidden about. <laughs> you can't really hide the fact that that one's a rifle cane, but I've shown that one on my channel, and this other one down here, which is more of what we're talking about. It's pretty well hidden. It's self-defense capabilities, that is. And of course, there were sword canes, but what is today's cane? Well, like a sword or knife cane, it's one that you have to pull loose from the body of the cane, right, via the handle, to expose the weapon and then use it. But it's not an edged weapon. Well, it kind of sort of is, in a way. Here you go. You might not be surprised to see a chain, because we talked so much about flails. But what's at the end of that chain? Funny enough, kind of a miniature version of some of the designs we've seen throughout the video. A heavy, heavy for its size, that is, metal and, you know, spiked slash studded, striking implement on the end of a flexible connection. So yeah, this is a flail cane. Trouble starts, you pull loose the weapon, this will give you an idea of the actual range, and you start swinging. As you can imagine, I was really glad to see this in person. It's very unusual for one thing, but of course it also plays into my specialty. I mean, I guess I'm the chronicler of the flexible impact weapons of the West, and I definitely don't know everything, like with the mistake I made in my very last video, uh, but somebody had to do it. And our very odd cane makes a fine addition to our virtual museum. Especially because it's way more of an outlier than you might think at first. Yeah, it kind of mirrors a lot of the things we showed earlier in the video, but those were pretty much all weapons of war. The personal flexible impact weapons of the West, the civilian ones, were much more like this, of course. Or this. Or this. Or, more importantly, this, a slung shot. Right? That's kind of what's the closest to what we're seeing in the cane. Again, old school, western, personal self-defense item. Or this one, slung shot here. Uh, side note, it's really nice that I have enough videos now that I can go back and reference my own work. Scrounging for pictures is annoying. 
And you can see what I mean. Today's object kind of looks none of like any of the ones we just reviewed. You could compare it to like a biker's get back whip. Any kind of weighted chain street weapon. But it's still a pretty odd duck. And I love how the cylindrical striking portion with the studs really harkens back to some of those ancient war designs. Now, is this a good design? Is it a good weapon? Well, it'll definitely get the job done if you hit somebody in the head with it. I don't think there's any doubt there. I think any shot to a bony surface, hand, wrist, elbow, knee, oh, good God, the knee would hurt. A shin bone as well, can you imagine? And a shot to a large, soft tissue target like the thigh, it wouldn't feel good by any stretch. And so it's got a lot of possibilities on offense. Keep in mind, it's a fully flexible weapon, which means, yes, you can hit yourself if you don't know how to use it. So if somebody owned this and actually carried it back in the day, it looked worn enough that I would say they did. But anyway, they would have been wise to practice. A kind of a cool fighting style available here. You use the cane body in your non-dominant hand defensively and offensively, but mostly defensively while swinging that flail with your dominant hand. That would make a Victorian mugger think twice before closing any further, I would think. And that brings up a really important point, psychology. I think part of the design here is to just scare the hell out of them. Once they hear the rattling chain, see that thing flailing out, you know, pun intended, and then swinging around, that's really going to take somebody by surprise, whereas it's a little bit more intuitive to see the knife or the sword pulled out from the cane body. And hey, as much as I love flexible impact weapons, would a sword cane be more practical? Well, yeah, I think so. An edged weapon is easier to use and deadlier. But it doesn't mean this thing isn't badass. And like any flail, it can do something that the sword blade cannot do, which is wrap around your opponent's block and strike home. Flails are all about the mantra that the best defense is a good offense. And in my opinion, that is not just a pipe dream. There is something to that. It's ballsy. It takes a lot of guts to go with that kind of a strategy in a fight, right? There's a reason people like shields. But for instance, on the excellent Weaponism channel, you can see in multiple videos how hard it is for an opponent with a rigid weapon to deal with an enemy that has a flexible one. It doesn't mean that it's better, just that it's particularly hard to deal with. And part of that is that it can, again, wrap around the opponent's block, whether that be a limb or a weapon, and hit them. And if you got hit in such a way with today's instrument, it would definitely not be fun. And as I've said before, this is why the old saying existed in Europe, no fence against a flail, as in no defense against a flail. Uh, funny enough, some people can make like eight hours worth of videos on flexible weapons, uh, nunchaku in particular, and never once touch on that feature, that defining feature of any fighting flail. Which is what our antique is today, and again, that makes it very rare for a defense cane. And as you probably know, what's the downside besides being able to hit yourself? Well, if you lose momentum and your opponent closes, you pretty much are holding a useless object in your hand. It also might accidentally wrap around something you don't want. So if it wraps around your opponent's wrist, oh, that's not bad. You yank as hard as you can, that's pretty good. Then smash them in the face with the handle that you're holding. But if it wraps around, say, their cane or a cudgel, well, it's going to help negate that weapon, but it completely negates yours. A downside to this particular design that we're looking at, this exact specimen, is that the chain and striking head just kind of rattle around in there when you move the cane in the right way. So that could give the game away or at least alert the other party that there's something <laughs> peculiar about your cane. Then again, the racket it makes when being unsheathed, so to speak, could have an intimidating effect. I don't think ASP-style batons are particularly good weapons, but some people like that the sound it makes as it extends and I believe them, will intimidate the other party sometimes. What an interesting item. I didn't know if it was, this was going to be a uh, like a 5-minute video or a 10-minute video or what, but I just know that we've gone well over that. I'll see here once I put it in the can. And there it is, the second most unusual antique self-defense cane I've ever seen. As always, thanks for watching.